Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> still a little bit of time until 9 a.m., seven minutes or so. But um, welcome back. Hope you guys are doing good. And we'll be starting in a bit. <clears throat> Hi guys, good morning. Good morning, Eva. Be right back. <clears throat>
Okay, hey guys, good morning. Sorry, I've had to step away for just a second and use the restroom. But we're almost to 9 a.m., so good time. <clears throat> if you're here and you're just hanging out watching, feel free to say hello or good morning or anything. <clears throat> Got a giant uh, picture of Ronald Palmer over there. Always got to be hydrated. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. It's 9 a.m. Good morning again. Um, today, we just basically have a pretty clear plan. We're going to finish up. Hi, guys. Senna, Celine, everyone. Um, we're going to finish up the notes on the Garrett Hardin article that we we're working on. And then um, I'll try to get you guys started on Judith Thompson's paper about the trolley problem. And uh, then we'll be all good for today. Did you guys notice something? Let me ask a question. Have you guys noticed the... Uh, uh, file that I sent with the study guide. Anybody can tell me if you've been able to see that because I did send it off. Okay, good, perfect. So <clears throat> thanks for that. So that just means that now you have the study guide. Next week, next, next Friday is the uh, midterm exam. So the plan next week is that Monday and Wednesday we'll have a review session using the study guide. We'll just go over as many of those questions as we can and then you know, I'm going to select some items off the study guide to place on the exam next Friday. But nobody knows exactly which ones that I will choose. All I'm telling you is that it's going to be something, you know, somewhere around like between 7 or 10 you'll have to answer. Um, and I'm just going to make my decisions, you know, kind of last minute, which ones that I'll select from the list. But you already have advanced, you know, access to the list, so you can be preparing um, any responses and uh, getting sample answers going and, you know, just asking any questions along the way. Will you be taking the midterm through Canvas? Well, <clears throat> I'll send you the uh, test form through Canvas, but you know, I want you guys to send me back your uh, file as an email attachment. Sometimes I've noticed that when people use Canvas to send and receive files, that it's less reliable than just using the email Outlook server on um, your school email. So my preference, <clears throat> although I mean, I'll, obviously I'm going to accept whatever people send me, but my preference is for you to just create a new email type my email address into the recipient line and attach your file that way. Like you're creating a new email, not just hitting reply to anything, but send, um, if that makes sense. So yeah, send me your exam as an attachment in an email that's addressed to me. Uh, how long do you want the responses for each question to be? Well, <clears throat> I'm mindful of the fact that we do have the time constraint. But um, I still want people to try and give the most thorough answers that they can. So, you know, how long? As long as possible. The, the longest you can do. So, I mean, whatever. If there's, a, if there's like six or seven questions, say I give you seven questions and it's a 50-minute test period. How long? Seven minutes long. Think of temporal length rather than spatial. Uh, just write as much as you can until you exhaust all the information and you can't say anything else. You have to be completely detailed and thorough and all of that. Um, because there's only a few evaluations of each student in the class. So the midterm and the final are important. Uh, you should not be trying to be brief. You should try to be long-winded. That's what I always tell people. Because a lot of times students have a standpoint of, what's the minimum I can give to get what I want? But you should always be trying to go over and above the minimum and reach for the stars. Be a maximalist. That's the way I've always approached everything, but school especially. Don't give a professor any opportunity to, de to debate whether you gave them a good answer or not. Blow it out of the water. Just destroy it. Just give them an answer that cannot ever be disputed. It's overwhelmingly clear, overwhelmingly accurate. That's the kind of standard that I think people should reach for. And it just sounds a little bit too unconfident when people are like, how much, whatever, you know. So, But the point is, uh, just write as much as you can and be thorough and detailed. Yes. Okay. So... Let's continue, guys. We have a lot of time to talk about that guide, so I just distributed it, and you can start looking at it in advance. But next week on Monday and Wednesday, we'll really go and dive right into it and go over all the questions, as many as we can. Um, maybe I'll also have an opportunity to provide a, an additional office hour. I think I might have to – I'll try to maybe reschedule my Friday office hours because they occur after the exam would have happened, and you might like to have a little bit of additional face time with me in case – uh, that helps you prepare. So I'll make an announcement next week about some rescheduled office time so that if anyone wants, they can get a few last minute questions in, in that way too. But all right, <clears throat> so let's go back into our notes. Uh, 
tell me where we were on the discussion of Garrett Hardin. If, I'm, if my memory serves me, we just described his whole uh, lifeboat situation. Didn't we do that? We talked about the lifeboat example and how he thinks that if you had a situation where there were too many people in the water, not enough space to carry everyone on the boat, that it would be not wise to, to bring all the people on board, right? Okay, good. So just a couple of points about Garrett Hardin. First of all, this is kind of like the, uh, the other side of the argument given by Peter Singer. Peter Singer's position, as we now learn, is um, you should try to do something to assist the global poor. He even thinks we have a moral obligation to do that. And the reason he argues for that is because many people live in absolute poverty, not having enough income or wealth to meet basic human needs. But then there's also plenty of people like us that are living in absolute affluence, which have more than enough income and wealth for the same basic human needs. So why couldn't we divert some of the additional wealth to the cause of poverty and hunger? And we can do that without making a big sacrifice of our own well-being. Is it anything like killing when a person fails to assist? Maybe it isn't. He mentions what the differences could be, uh, but he also argues that though there are those differences, there's not necessarily, um, it's not totally morally blameless when a person fails to assist. And then um, he gives the argument in favor of the obligation, basically saying that when you can prevent bad things without making comparable or major sacrifices, then you should, and that you can prevent some absolute poverty without making huge sacrifices, so you should. Uh, then there were objections that were discussed, and we kind of spent some time at the first half of the meeting yesterday, or sorry, on Monday, going over the objections, whether it was taking care of our own, leaving it to the government, triage, um, or property rights, and you heard his replies to those. Okay, so then now there's Garrett Hardin, and just a bit about him. He said to start off the paper um, that he does not like, so first of all, his paper is called Lifeboat Ethics, The Case Against Helping the Poor. And in the paper, he begins by just attacking a metaphor that was then gaining popularity, but he didn't like the metaphor. He thought it was inaccurate, which was the idea that uh, it's a spaceship Earth, and we should all share it as kind of one common home. Think of it as our you know, giant spaceship that we're all passengers on. Uh, but he doesn't like the metaphor because he thinks that it implies that there is an equal right to an equal share of the world's resources. But uh, there is no such equal right. Or if there were, he thinks that it would uh, destroy the ability for nations to achieve prosperity um, and to uh, safeguard <clears throat> the prosperity that they've already established. From there, he says there's a better metaphor to use. He also criticizes the metaphor on the grounds that there's no international um, leader of the planet as there would be on the case of a real ship. Now, after that, he says, there's a better metaphor I could offer, which is the lifeboat situation or hypothetical. So in this lifeboat metaphor, as I was mentioning, there's this, there's a, each wealthy nation is symbolized by a lifeboat floating in the ocean. And um, say the United States lifeboat has 50 passengers, but it has space for 60. So there's a little spare room, but then there's a hundred people in the water that are stra uh, struggling to survive and they're in danger of drowning. Now, this is sort of supposed to roughly correspond to the statistics that indicate that two-thirds of the world's nations are uh, poor and one-third are wealthy. So it's kind of like there's 50 in the boat that's safe and sound and 100 in the water, two-thirds of the total struggling. So what should one do? If one brings all 100 aboard, uh, then the boat would sink because it would overstretch its capacity to provide. Um, and that might be the most uh, the most consistent with a humanitarian feeling, but it would lead to an unworkable um, situation and it would be worse in the end for everybody. So that's not good. Maybe bring 10, but he also finds 10 to be not ideal because it, I guess he argues, compromises the safety factor or the safety margin because now it's full to its absolute capacity. So in his judgment, the best would be to, to not let anybody on board and to maintain kind of like a guard or vigilant uh, stance against those that would board without permission. And I guess in a way, you can kind of see a big difference already here between the, the perspective of Singer and Hardin. You know, when Singer sees poor people and starving people in the world, as a utilitarian, um, you know, he looks at that as human beings who um, are suffering and whose happiness could be improved and that that would be morally good. So he looks at, you know, the global poor with a sympathetic eye, with an eye of concern and, um, you know, care. But in the case of uh, Hardin, it's more like an antagonistic stance, like, oh, the, the third world poor actually uh, present some kind of uh, danger to the prosperity 
currently enjoyed by the wealthier, more prosperous nations. And so instead, it's a more defensive, guarded stance than a sort of open hand. Um, well, <clears throat> the next point in his discussion as he develops his argument here is to talk about the differing rates of reproduction in the first and the third world. We talked about that, guys. Can anybody remind me? Did we make a mention in his essay as we were breaking it down about the uh, facts concerning the different reproduction rates that occur? Did we talk about that? Okay, good, yeah. So he makes a point about this as well. Uh, overall, just because I'm summarizing some of that right now, um, wealthier nations just reproduce and create a new generation of children uh, slower than, than poorer nations do. And um, there's a number of different socioeconomic reasons for that. But in the end, yeah, so if our nation and other wealthy first world nations will double the population size every 87 years or so, but poor nations do that roughly every 35 years or so, then if the current trends remain stable into the future, then over an 87 year period, while our population would increase to twice its size, a cohort of poor nations with the same total numbers would have doubled, redoubled, and been on the way towards the third cycle of doubling. So he points out that if we established an initiative to share um, resources or to assist a set number of poor people, and if the program began by assigning um, 300 million wealthy citizens to 300 million poor citizens in the third world, the ratio of those giving to receiving aid would be one to one at the beginning. But after 87 years, it would no longer be one to one because since the uh, poor population is lapping us um, more than uh, once over, the ratio becomes one to three or even worse. So he thinks that although it may be well intended, uh, signing ourselves on to such programs of international uh, aid um, enlists us in an ever-expanding philanthropic burden that eventually becomes unsustainable just due to the burgeoning population size of the third world that we would in fact uh, facilitate through the provision of the aid, which he argues is counter to um, any solution to the problem. So in a way, as he's arguing, it makes the thing, the situation worse than it otherwise would have been, even though it's uh, done with the best of intentions. Now, <clears throat> that kind of leads us into his discussion of the tragedy of the commons. Now, is that something that I mentioned, tragedy of the commons? Maybe I didn't get to talk about that, so I'll, I'll, I'll let us know a little bit about this. It's an important concept in his work. Garrett Hardin, uh, he's probably most well-known for this concept, the tragedy of the commons, which is a somewhat economic concept, too. Um, so we're just wrapping up this material for Garrett Hardin. And as you guys have learned, his paper is Lifeboat Ethics. <clears throat> the case against helping the poor from 1974. <clears throat> okay, now um, we've reached the point in this article where he begins to discuss this concept, the tragedy of the commons. And that's probably his uh, longest lasting kind of legacy in the academy in terms of an idea he had, the tragedy of the commons. Okay, so the idea in a way is kind of simple, uh, but here, Drew, let me see your question. But what if the growth rate of the population in third world countries reduces as a result of aid? Very good question, Drew, and I'm glad that you asked that, because this is something that I've thought, uh, whenever I teach this article of his, you know, my job is really to just sort of remain neutral and to present both sides of the argument, but this is certainly a weakness in his case that I've also thought about. Um, is he being a little uncharitable in his assessment that poor nations are poor today, poor in the past, and forevermore always be poor, and their rates of reproduction will remain stable and, um, and overcharged for, for all time? That, I think, is um, an unfair assumption because, look, if the poor nations made a transition to a more developed living standard, then their rates of reproduction would fall in line with the rates experienced in wealthier parts of the world. So through the provision of aid and um, through economic growth, we should expect that those countries which are currently reproducing at such rapid rates would slowly begin to decline as they started to have higher standards of living um, 
and support. So in a way, he's making a static assumption that wealthy nations will always maintain the same kind of socioeconomic characteristics and reproduction rates forevermore, and the same with poor nations. And these are things that are just immutable and unchangeable. But that's something that certainly could be challenged. Um, and I think that it's probably one of the weaker assumptions in his paper for sure. Yeah, if we just grant him his premise that there's an unsustainable uh, runaway population growth happening in the third world that we're merely, merely facilitating by means of aid, then it makes his argument look pretty you know, reasonable. But I'm kind of uh, in line with maybe your skepticism there, Drew, if you're making a point that um, there's no real reason to assume that it has to be that way. Why should it be that a poor nation can never make a transition to a more developed standard of living and join the first world nations? Okay, good. But back to his presentation, right, the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is a pretty basic idea. It's the idea that um, when there are public resources that are shared in common, that are available without restrictions on access to all, so that's a commons, uh, something that anyone can take from freely and it's not privatized. When there are public resources, the argument says uh, they are destined to fail from overutilization and poor management. Uh, but privately owned resources don't experience that. So that means we should not be supportive of any kind of public resources, or in other words, we should reject the commons. So let me put that idea here. Uh, <clears throat> public resources are um, destined to fail from overuse and poor maintenance unlike private resources. So that's the tragedy of the comment. Um, now let me try and explain some examples of of this that he himself uses. Um, okay, so suppose that there was an acre of farmland, right? One acre of land that can be used for uh, farming. And like, suppose that this one acre of land is then opened to the public. So um, now that it's open to the public, people who have like farm animals, like cattle or pigs or whatever, are free to just bring them to the land there and uh, graze on the land or whatever, make use of it how they want. So if the one acre has been opened and turned into a commons for the public to use, um, who's gonna come there? Who do you think? If it's becoming a commons, then um, who, just in general, would be going there? Okay, Eva, everyone, right? Why wouldn't they? Uh, because it's not like, only some people can use it, it's open to all. So without any restrictions, yeah, all farmers, fair enough. Yeah, anybody who has any need to use something like that, that could utilize the resource, will come and try to use it. So what you'd expect is that having turned it into a commons, there's quickly gonna be a rush of people, a lot of people coming to use it. So it'll be overused. Will it be maintained and kept nice and tidy and neat and clean and sustainable? That's the other problem, no. Why is it that none of the people in the commons will do their part to make sure that it remains clean, sustainable, and orderly? Well, because it's not theirs, right? It's not their private property. So if, if it falls to ruin, if it looks um, dirty, disorganized, uh, or whatever, it doesn't really reflect negatively on any individual member of the commons because it's not their own property. And if they all overuse it and poorly maintain it, and thus it is overgrazed and it becomes useless, and the one acre cannot be used by anybody. Um, and that's what you would expect to happen. It's going to be overused. No one's going to take care of it. Because basically when a commons exists, people will have an incentive to use it. Because when resources are available, people just take the resources. But nobody's going to want to support the sustainability and upkeep of a resource that doesn't belong to them. Because there's no loss in case the commons is destroyed since it's not generated by private investment of a person who's um, therefore got some incentive to maintain it. 
So it's a recipe for a disaster. Everyone brings their animals, so there's too many animals grazing, no one's cleaning up after themselves, and so in short order, the commons is destroyed. But what if that one acre of land was not private public, but rather was just owned by a private farmer, right? If it was owned by a private farmer or group, would it have too many animals there? Um, would it be poorly maintained? No, because if the private farmer mismanages and destroys his acre of land, uh, then what happens? He loses the value of his own investment. And so he has every self-interested motive to not allow that to happen um, because he doesn't want to squander whatever time, money, and investment that he's put into his private property or, or resource. So where there are private resources, they're well taken care of and they're not overutilized because if they were, it would redound to the disadvantage of the private owner. When there are public resources, they're, they're quite uh, you know, well utilized, but there's no restrictions on use, so they're overutilized. And since there's no matching feeling of personal obligation or responsibility to care for something, since it's not one's possession, then there's, there's utilization, but there's no um, contribution to its sustainability. So that's why he thinks commons are destined to fail, and he calls it a tragedy because uh, it's kind of like, this is why we can't have nice things. Um, if we could all act with mutual restraint and be conscientious of what we contribute to and take away from the commons, then we could have such things. But he thinks that human nature being what it is, when there's a resource for you to exploit, you're going to want to get the most out of it for the least work, right? Um, in fact, if there is one member of the commons who is one of those conscientious people, and who says, hey, everybody, I'm not going to bring too many animals here, and I'm going to make sure that I clean up after myself and keep my little patch nice and neat. That person, in a way, it, there's no rationale behind that because they put themselves at a disadvantage. Do they get more access to the commons than everybody else who's just being greedy and reckless? No, they get the same access because it's public. But are they doing more work than all those other people are? Also, yes. So, like, you know, if you go into the public restroom with, like, a – cleaning tools because you're like, you know, this is too messy and someone needs to clean it up. Um, you're giving more labor to the sustainability of the public resource, but you're getting to use it just the same as everyone else. So that's why people generally don't do that. Why will you contribute more of your time, energy, labor, money, or whatever uh, to get access to something that everyone else already has the same level of access to? So there's no incentive anyway in a commons for the individuals to do their part to maintain it. So he thinks that's where they're going to end up being destroyed. This is also seen, there are some other examples that are more realistic, like uh, take the case of air and water pollution. There's no private ownership of the air of the world, right? We all just breathe that. But because nobody privately owns it, everybody feels free to dump pollution into the air without limitation. So they're kind of exploiting the existence of the valued resource, but doing nothing to maintain its sustainability into the future. And that, according to Hardin, is because it's something that's not private and rather it's just a commons. Same with water, right? Nobody owns the oceans of the world. They're just there. But that means that people and companies feel free to pollute them without limitation. So once again, because there's no private ownership, nobody feels compelled to protect these things, but rather to just exploit them uh, and get the most they can out of the available public resource. So taking it back to his big argument that we shouldn't be supportive of uh, international aid to the poor, he thinks that the World Food Bank uh, is one mess, one example of a commons that's bound to fail also. Now, what's the World Food Bank? It was a relatively new idea in his time, but it's been around for a while now. And the World Food Bank is a system where wealthy nations contribute to a supply of available food and consumable resources according to their surplus, and poor nations withdraw from the food bank according to their needs. So it's supposed to be like a humanitarian program which establishes a joint fund of consumable resources for the poor at the World Food Bank, right? It's a humanitarian idea, but in his mind, it's just another commons. And the way that he sees it as a commons is this. The poor nations will draw from the World Food Bank because it's available to all, and there are no restrictions on their ability to draw from it, but they won't contribute to its long-term sustainability in the sense that they won't do anything to wean themselves off of the need to use the World Food Bank. In fact, he argues, they would simply um, use the resources made available by the food bank to continue to reproduce at these rapid rates 
thus making the commons unsustainable into the long-term future. So it's once again a case where you're trying to provide a common resource, a public resource, but it's going to be drawn from more than it's going to be contributed into in terms of making it something that can last over time. Um, and he believes that the real beneficiaries of such programs like the World Food Bank are not necessarily the poor uh, because, you know, he thinks that this is an artificial way of supporting the poor. And in the end, since we haven't addressed the underlying causes of global poverty and hunger, we're just causing that group to get bigger in numbers, which intensifies the problem, perhaps, as he would argue. Um, well, who stands to benefit from this? He thinks it's not the poor who are merely having their numbers artificially enlarged to their detriment, ultimately down the line. The real beneficiaries, he argues, are in some cases um, companies that produce um, shipping for food to transport it from point A to point B, farm machinery, uh, pesticide companies who also have to be involved in producing the supply of food that goes to the World Food Bank. And so they're going to get a government taxpayer funded kickback to be part of this program. And therefore, he thinks that those bureaucrats that staff those agencies and stuff are the true uh, supporters and beneficiaries of it, using the humanitarian uh, issue as a kind of inducement for people to support their view. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> that's his idea about the tragedy of the commons, rail and shipment companies, farm machinery and pesticide manufacturing companies uh, inherit some of the wealth that's devoted to those programs when they're established as a policy. Now, Hardin knows that many people will still see this argument and say, but come on, I mean, don't be naive. Someone's going to make money off of any program, whether it ends up being beneficial or not. The real question is not whether some other people stand to profit off of it, but just does it help people? Does it feed people? If it does, then isn't it good regardless? And in his mind, he's just really, he really refuses to budge on that question because he keeps insisting about how he thinks it's just over flooding the population size of the poor parts of the world, which Drew, as we've talked about earlier, may not be a fair assumption. Um, you know, I think that he's a little bit too set in his ways of thinking that poor nations could never transform their economy or, you know, join the ranks of the developed nations, at which time you would expect, uh, and evidence has shown, that they would in fact start to um, moderate the rate of reproduction for all the socioeconomic reasons given. Um, now, he also talks briefly at the end about the concept of immigration, and I'm sure you can imagine based on his views concerning global aid that he's one of the people that is uh, like opposed to permissive immigration uh, policies. You know, he argues for like really strict controls and protocols to limit you know, incoming immigration um, to a wealthy nation like ours. He says, um, by doing that, by allowing people to come here, we provide opportunity to all kinds of people throughout the world that are poor and struggling. But he wonders if it makes sense to us because he thinks that that could help to degrade the quality of our own life here. Now, I don't know why he says that. I mean, it's almost as if he thinks that people can't be integrated into a society or that they just pose a danger or a risk. I don't think that's well argued for at all. Um, the most, I guess, reasonable way to think about what he's saying is that he thinks it has to do with the size of the population in our country. And so if that becomes too big, then maybe we have less, um, you know, open space or access to resources or there's too much competition or something. Um, but he doesn't really well spell that out exactly. He thinks, though, that there, once again, there are big, big businesses and uh, special interests that are supportive of permissive immigration policies. Um, he talks about the desire for big companies to have cheap labor to do degrading work that Americans wouldn't necessarily want to do, and that they are sometimes the ones, he argues, that are lobbying for um, more open border or more permissive immigration policies. Now, he knows that a lot of people will condemn that position of his as harsh and as obviously overlooking the whole fact that this country, the United States, is a nation of immigrants and it's founded by people who've come here from distant shores, except of, unless, of course, you're Native American. Um, and he says some people are going to condemn his view because of that. But his final word in the end is that he thinks that's just unrealistic idealism. Uh, he kind of tries to portray himself to the reader as like a tough-minded realist. And he says... If we wanted to be purely just, I mean, to be like 
ideally just, the right thing would be to simply return the land to Native Americans because there was no fair mechanism by which it was transferred to the ownership of, of settlers and, and Europeans and colonizers. But of course, nobody seriously argues for that, that we should simply um, withdraw the, the current population and return this to the Native Americans. So he says, in a way, an idea that's based in pure justice is often impractical and impossible to execute. He makes this claim that um, since we cannot redo the past, we have to accept the things that have happened and uh, move into the future from where we are today instead of where we would have liked to have been if things had been more fair before us. So um, he says, until we really are like a, a spaceship Earth, like a one world government system, then we should instead apply the ethics used by his lifeboat um, argument instead of the, in the, the picture given by environmentalists and humanitarians. So anyway, that's the, the idea of Garrett Hardin. I um, you know, had to finish up his work, and uh, most of it is just going through the whole lifeboat scenario, talking about the tragedy of the commons, and then applying those concepts to what he thinks they mean for um, policies advocating international aid or the World Food Bank. Okay, so there you go. That's the last word on Garrett Hardin. Um, everyone's got their own views, you know, and I'm kind of trying to give you all uh, all available arguments within the debate. My own perspective is much closer to the ideas of Peter Singer, um, but you know, Garrett Hardin, I read him when I was back in college, and at least the tragedy of the commons idea had some resonance with me, but I think that he takes its implications uh, maybe a little overboard in my mind. But anyway, each of us has our own views. So now we're moving from Garrett Hardin, and we just have one more um, author before we start to prepare for the um, the midterm and the review sessions. So next Monday and Wednesday, that's all set aside for the review. And today and the remaining part of Friday, we're going to try and just go over a lot of the stuff with uh, Judith Thompson. So let me help you guys learn about this author now. Okay, so Judith Jarvis Thompson and this is the trolley problem. Okay, Judith Thompson trolley problem. Just opening here to the section of the book. Okay, so I think she's still living too, but I want to double check this. She, she was born in 1929, so it, she's getting up there, but, oh yeah, she's still going strong. In fact, wow, it's almost happy birthday. Her birthday was October 4th, 1929. So yeah, Judith Thompson, born in 1929, and still with us today. She's the author of this paper called The Trolley Problem, and she's a distinguished American philosopher. She's taught at a lot of big uh, institutions, and she's published some major work. Um, she worked for more than three decades at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is obviously one of the big uh, schools and definitely great in philosophy, science, and STEM and all that. Um, she's really famous for a paper she wrote. She, she, so she's big in ethics, um, which is the topic of our course that we're looking at right now. And she wrote a classic paper in 1971 called The Defense of Abortion, which actually um, is taught in a lot of universities, when people learn about the ethical debate concerning like pro-life and pro-choice, um, that's a landmark essay. You know, Roe versus Wade was decided in 1974, and there was a whole bunch of like interesting policy papers and philosophy arguments being published in the academy that led up to that decision. Um, and so, her paper from 1971, "Defense of Abortion," is considered like a classic. But um, she's written on a whole bunch of other topics too, and this discussion of the trolley problem. Um, explores some debated questions about intuitions we have concerning the ethics of killing versus letting die. Really the question is what makes it um, okay on the one hand to either allow a person to die or kill and what is the difference between killing and letting die ethically. So um, the trolley problem for some reason I've noticed has enjoyed a little renaissance of pop culture um, 
popularity over the last few years. Like anybody who's ever watched or heard of the show The Good Place, maybe some of you guys have heard of that show, right, on NBC, I think. And I think they now have it on Netflix and you can just stream and, you know, binge watch. But uh, they had an episode where they, they played around with this whole trolley problem concept because one of the main characters in uh, Good Place, the guy Chidi, is like a moral uh, philosopher. Um, so they integrate lessons of ethics and philosophy into some of the episodes. And there's one about the trolley problem. There's also a whole wealth of funny, funny memes. Uh, there's just trolley problem memes. I follow a Facebook group called Trolley Problem Memes. And um, it's just jokes on jokes. And, if, and they're, they're pretty funny. It's a, sometimes a little dark humor. But, you know, if you can handle that, um, it's, it's quite good. So anyway, just giving you a couple of current uh, touchstones to kind of see this uh, discussion about this essay. But let's jump into it and find out what is going on. All right, so this essay, it relies heavily on a couple of thought experiments. Um, so just as we've learned in philosophy, there's often the use of hypothetical scenarios, and there is definitely in this paper here. The trolley problem, by the way, this paper is from 1985. <clears throat> okay. So um, I want you to imagine the situation that we're going to call trolley driver. Okay, now I'm gonna create some room here to have some more sp space to draw. Okay, so here's the situation of trolley driver. You've got a trolley, and this is it, and it's on a track going forward. Now there's a problem though, okay? Um, here's a trolley driver here. This is the guy that's in the trolley, driving it. It's on a forward path along the track, but there's definitely an issue. Over here in front of where the trolley is headed on the track, you have five people. So what do you see in here? I mean, it's not good. There's people in the way of a trolley. The trolley's on a forward path towards them, and if it hits all these people and it continues, it's going to kill them. They're standing on the trolley track. They can't be removed from it. And the trolley is directly headed at them. So not good. Five people dying is a horrible thing. So that's not a good thing. What can be done? Well, there's actually one thing that can be done. You see this driver? He has a switch here. And there's a fork in the trolley track, a tangent that takes it off in a different stretch. If he flips that switch, it's not going to hit the five. It's going to switch tracks and go in the other direction, and it won't hit those five. But there's still an issue, though, okay? Because if this guy hits the switch to prevent the collision with the five people, and it does go in this other direction, there's still just one person on that side of the track, okay? So it's like <clears throat> nothing really can be done to prevent some number of people from getting hit by the trolley and killed. If it goes on its current trajectory, it's going to kill five. If he hits the switch, it won't continue going towards five. It'll go to a different track. And that would not kill five, but it would kill one, which is obviously much less than five. So the way that the article uh, and the, the dilemma is given to the reader is by means of asking you critical questions about your intuitions, your moral intuitions. So let me see from you guys here in this chat. Do you think it would be permissible, morally permissible, to him to switch the track so that he doesn't hit five and instead he just hits the one? Would that be okay to do? Yes or no? Okay, Eva, you're giving me the answer yes. And you know, I mean, you don't have to be shy. These are hypothetical scenarios, and we're just talking about what do you think would be perhaps okay or or not okay. And so it seems like the general going reaction from some who've you know offered up their thoughts is that it would not be wrong, or that in other words, it is okay, I guess. The affirmative answer is, would it be okay to switch the tracks? And you're saying yes. Let's ask ourselves why. Why are we having this thought that that's not really the wrong thing? Okay, well, keep in mind, there's no alternative to hitting some of the people. I'm sure some of you are thinking, come on, in this hypothetical, can't they run away? Or No, that can't happen, okay? For some reason, they're just on the tracks. So nobody wants to, anyone to get hit by a trolley. But... You know, if someone's getting hit by it, wouldn't you hope that it's not as many as possible, but as few as possible? So given the forced choice, it's going to hit five or it's going to hit one, 
you guys are in good company. So, so this essay and the examples that have been used have actually been studied in research settings thousands of times in different groups. And so you're not the first person ever to be told this question, would it be okay or not? You're, you're way down the line. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been asked this exact question because this scenario is used as a test of moral intuitions. And you're in good company, not to worry, because the overwhelming vast majority of people, like over 90%, they agree. That's not wrong, of course. You know, he doesn't, if he hits the switch, it's a tragedy. This guy has been hit by the trolley and killed, but it's, it's not as bad as hitting five. So that's how most all people react to this case. But we're not done yet because the thing is we're going to compare this trolley driver case to another situation that we've already talked about earlier in the semester. And this is our familiar transplant scenario. Okay, so taking you guys back really quick to the transplant thing. So in the transplant case, if you remember, there were these five sick people. And what was the issue with them is that they were each suffering from an organ failure. So like needs a heart, needs a liver, needs a kidney, needs the other kidney, needs the lung. They all need a different vital organ. They're going to die if they don't get it. Suppose that there then is a doctor that they see. Here's the doctor, and the doctor's trying to find any donor. They all have that same matching blood type. So really only one donor is necessary to save the lives. Suppose that a person who's young and healthy arrives to the doctor's office just looking for a physical, and that person is discovered to have the same blood type. So now imagine our doctor has this choice. Should I, shall I kill you know, the one person to get the organs out of their body to give to the five because he's not willing to just, you know, offer them. Um, now, let's ask the question on this. What's your moral intuition here? Would that be okay or not? Or let's be specific. Is that morally permissible or morally impermissible to, to kill the one patient to give his organs to five and save all their five lives? Would that be permissible or not? Okay, you're saying no, not permissible. Good. Um, and that's really just something that is almost universally agreed to also. So just taking stock of where we're at, when people are hit with this situation, this scenario, they say it's okay for him to switch the track. But when you give them the transplant scenario, they say it is wrong for the one man to be killed to save five. And this is the start of the beginnings of the so-called problem or dilemma. The dilemma that we're looking at is why and for what reason do people react differently to these two cases? Because although the cases do have some differences, there's some core similarities between them. Can you see what they are? In the two examples of trolley driver and transplant, there's an individual, either this driver or this doctor, who's in a position where if they take an action, which results in a person's death, it will also prevent the death of five. But in this case, we say it's okay to take that action. While in this case, transplant, we say it is wrong for him to take that action. So the question becomes, what is the distinguishing factor between the two cases or scenarios which generates these different responses from audiences? The audience overwhelmingly saying, this is okay to do, switching the track. But this is wrong to do, killing the one patient. And so then the author, Thompson, is trying to you know, pinpoint why we do react differently to the two cases and why that's the overwhelming normal reaction that people have. We have to then trace the different reactions to differences in the two cases, but how are they different and what factor or feature is leading to these divergent responses? Okay, now <clears throat> Thompson refers to one attempted solution to this problem that was given by another mid-century woman philosopher named Philippa Foote. A very interesting name, that unusual name, but Philippa Foote was another philosopher who also discussed the trolley problem and she thought, aha, I've solved it. But what Thompson says in this paper from 1985 is that she actually thinks Philippa Foote's solution doesn't work. But let's try and walk you through Foote's solution to the problem. Okay. So uh, I'll put some info up here about Foote's so-called solution. But anyway, just 
quick little drawing of the trolley. It's going towards five. Track and fork. There's a driver here. Okay. Now, here's Foote's solution to the problem. She says the solution can be understood by looking at these two principles, and these two moral principles seem immediately um, obvious. Okay, so the first one says that it is worse to kill five than to kill one. Okay, worse to kill five than one. Second principle says that it's worse to kill one than to let five die, okay? Okay, so this pair of principles here is supposed to, according to Foote, solve the problem or explain the, the reason for the different response. So take the first one. It's worse to kill five than to kill one. Well, if it, and that seems true, right? I mean, killing is a terrible thing, and it's one of the worst things ever um, that anyone could do. But, of course, doing more of that is worse than doing less. So if a person kills 100, that's obviously a lot worse than if they killed two or three. Um, so the numbers matter, and all that's saying is that when there's five, that's more death than one. So this guy, the driver, think about him. He's in a trolley, and he's driving towards people. If he continues on one path, he, he will drive into them, and he will kill the five people. If he switches paths, then the same trolley is not going to kill five. It's going to kill one. So the choice of the driver, it looks like this choice. Am I going to kill five or one? Well, I better just try to do the thing that's not as bad. Because killing one is not as bad as five. But let's think about the choice of the transplant surgeon, okay? Now, if the transplant surgeon intervenes to try and save their lives by, by taking this guy out, what would he be doing? He'd be killing a person. He'd be the reason, the direct cause of the one person's death, if he did that, right? But if he doesn't kill the one guy, and he refuses to do that, or he just chooses not to do that, well, then what's the situation with those five? If the surgeon guy doesn't kill the other healthy patient and those five people die, how did they die? Is it because he killed them or what? I'm asking you this. What's the choice of our surgeon? It's not kill one or kill five. It's what or what? Tell me. <clears throat> the surgeon's choice. A little different from the driver's choice because it's not about kill more or less. It's about just even kill anybody, one person. Or the person's alternative is... Whom to save? What do you mean, whom to save? He's not going to save anybody if he doesn't kill somebody. What do you mean? <laughs> not quite. Yeah, exactly, Jason. It's kill one or let five die. Because if he declines to kill this person, they're going to die, but they're not going to die because of him. They're not going to die because the surgeon did it. They're going to die because they have, you know, a natural cause, the organ failure, and their poor health, you see? So... This doctor's choice is between killing one or letting five die. But according to this second principle, killing is so much worse than just standing back and not getting involved in, in preventing people from dying. That it's a way worse thing to take an action that kills than to even allow five people to die of their own problems. So if he kills the one person, he'd be doing the worst thing. Because it's worse to kill a person than to allow five to die from existing ailments. But if the trolley driver switches the track, He's doing the less worse thing because in that case, unlike the bottom scenario of transplant, he's not by switching tracks, um, you know, he, he doesn't have a choice between killing and letting die because in the case of these five people getting hit, they're getting hit by his trolley and then he's the direct cause of their death. So does this solve the problem? It looks like it might. It looks like the reason that we have the different reactions is because the driver is just doing the thing that's not as bad. But the transplant surgeon, when he intervenes, he's doing the thing that's worse. Um, because, again, the transplant's not choosing between killing just more or less people. He's choosing between killing anybody or allowing people to die from problems that he did not cause. Um, so it looks like this could solve the, the whole question of why do people react differently to the two scenarios. But Judah Thompson 
very clever philosopher and writer. She says, basically, not so fast. There's still a problem here. And this solution does not ultimately uh, explain why we react in those different ways. So that's where we will kind of pick it up on Friday. Uh, I have more to say to you about the trolley problem and why Thompson thinks that Foote's solution didn't quite get us there. Um, so ultimately, we'll see what Thompson's solution is, which she thinks is, of course, the correct one. Um, but we've got to develop some of uh, the ideas of her paper a little more. So one more lesson on Thompson's trolley problem, and then next week we'll go over the review session. And I'll be finishing your guys' papers as well over the weekend. So then, thanks, everybody. Um, are we all good? I guess we've run to the last minute. But I appreciate your uh, attendance again, and I guess just have a good day, right? I'll see you back then on Friday, and let me know between then and now if there's anything else that you need or if you have any questions. Okay, have a good one, and I'll see you soon. <clears throat>